Our scripture lesson this morning will be taken from Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 23. One day, Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up. Take your mat and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> I appreciate Rick and, and Alan. They're new friends of ours, and we're grateful uh, to have them this season. And uh, when I heard Rick speak, when I got to know him, I thought, boy, we got to get him to read scripture someday. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Lovely voice. You know, back in Bible times, people believed that sickness was directly related to sin. And so people wondered if you were sick or if you had a disability or an ailment, what sin you might have committed. Or if it wasn't you that committed the sin, perhaps it was your parents. You remember one day Jesus was walking with his disciples and they came upon a blind man and the disciples asked, Jesus, why is this person blind? Was it because of his sin or the sin of his parents? And Jesus said, neither. He was born this way so that the glory of God might be shown through him and through that encounter Jesus healed the blind man. Well, over the years, we have come to know that diseases and ailments of every kind are not related to sin. They are simply, you know, the various things that happen to us uh, in a, as we live in a broken world. We no longer have doctors telling us that if it were not for our sin in our life, that we wouldn't have a certain diagnosis or a certain ailment. And yet, I've had enough experience to know that even though we know that the various things that we struggle with, various ailments or diseases or even addictions, really is not only tied to the fact that a lot of that that confronts us is not our fault, but that there are more things going on in our life. Many of you know I struggle with PTSD, and whenever I have a PTSD uh, episode, as I like to call them, which happens pretty infrequently, I have a kind of a process in place First thing I do is, is tell Christina. She kind of warns the kids, and I try to come in, as, with, in contact with as few people as possible. You know, it's just one of those days where I just mark the day, not having a good day, and I either call in to work or work from home or just try to pull up in the office until it passes through. And over the years, I know that that is a disease. But even then, I still feel in many ways so guilty that I have those feelings. And even though some of us are diagnosed with various things, it is hard for us to escape those deeper feelings in our heart. I know my PTSD is not my fault. I know that the tragedy that befell my family is 
is not my fault. We're victims. And I know that when I go through those episodes, those are the things that are in my life that are a part of that disease. And yet even then, I know that regardless of that, we still, I still struggle with something that we all struggle with, and that of sin sickness. You see, I learned long ago of uh, that old word. It was uh, something I probably read in the, a book from the 40s or 50s, that word sin sickness. And we know that illnesses are illnesses, diseases are diseases. We have medical advancements and technologies and therapies that can help us with our ailments and our disabilities and our disease. But sin sickness is something we all have in common. And I realized that even though that disease that I carry with me of PTSD is not of my own making, it's not a result of my sin, I still know that when I am inflicted with that, it, is, it gets all entangled with my sin and my sinful being. It gets all entangled with the brokenness that exists within me. And I realize that though that disease, apart from me, is not my fault, not a consequence of something that I have done, I know that we still have to, I still have to acknowledge sin and the sin sickness that it wraps me up and envelops me and entangles with the, these things for which I struggle and the sin sickness that might entangle itself within the things that you struggle with or the hardships you have. All along noting that if we don't acknowledge it or if I don't acknowledge it at least, I feel like I'm a dying star and that will collapse in on itself. I've come to realize that those guilty feelings I have are things I just have to overcome and give over to God. But the sin sickness wraps itself up and gets its tendrils into every aspect of our life. For all of the medical technologies we have, for all the therapies that we apply and the various interventions that we apply to bring healing to our bodies and to our minds, I have really come to know that mending our cup, becoming fully whole, is impossible without addressing sin sickness. That we can apply therapy and counseling and various medicines, we can apply the various technologies, but to bring full healing, to come to complete healing, the type of healing in which Jesus calls us to walk into requires us to acknowledge sin in our life. It might not be tied to the illnesses and ailments we carry, but it certainly is tied to the human condition. And whether you're in good health or bad health, all of us have in common sin sickness. There's an old Episcopal priest by the name of uh, Barbara Brown Taylor, uh, from Georgia, in fact, who wrote a book called Speaking About Sin. And she kind of cracks a joke. She said, you know, it's, it's not common for, uh, for her friends, uh, her Episcopal friends, to uh, talk about sin. So she decided to write a book on it to remind her her friends in the Episcopal Church, that, you know, sin exists and other uh, movements as well. Kind of a joke, she says. But she says that's common in a lot of churches. There are a lot of churches in which we fail to acknowledge and really talk anymore about sin. We think it's an old-fashioned word, or we think it's something that, uh, that um, we kind of uh, consider irrelevant. Some churches there on the opposite side. All they do is talk about sin and hellfire and brimstone. I'm sure you've been in churches like that. But she says we have really habits that, that we have that, that minimizes sin. One thing she says is that for some people, sin is merely a list of behaviors that other people do. Yeah, I like that one, you know. You, you write down all the lists of the sins that exist, and it turns out that those sins are what other people do. Seems like those that should be on your list are, are not there. Another temptation Barbara Brown Taylor talks about is privatizing sin to the point or so much in which we've privatized it that we have forgotten what the importance and we've forgotten how to confess and in turn forgotten how to repent. So this is a problem for a lot of Protestant churches. You know, um, Dr. Carter and I always talk about how during the Protestant Reformation, when, when there was such an antipathy for, for Catholic, Catholic ritual, and the Catholic Church, a lot of Protestants, including Baptists, threw the baby out with the bathwater. And one of those things uh, that have gone by the wayside is confession. In fact, if you mention confession in front of a bunch of Baptists, uh, they, they kind of uh, gristle and kind of get uncomfortable. It's kind of like Baptists who get maybe a little uncomfortable about Lent, noting that without Lent, when would we fast? When would we take the time to go to the cross?
It's one of those things we're not used to, and so we have privatized sin, we have forgotten how to confess, and because of that, we have forgotten really how to repent. It's the Bible, not any particular Christian movement that said in the book of James, is any among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Barbara Brown Taylor notes that really without that, without recognizing the, the, and acknowledge sin sickness, and while we forget how to confess and therefore how to repent, there is always a part of us that has yet to be mended and healed, and we will always fall short of the healing that Jesus has for us. And she says yet a third temptation is that we simply ignore or deny sin. We just don't talk about it. We really don't think about it. We don't want to appear too judgmental. We certainly don't want to appear hypocritical, so we just leave it uh, by the wayside. Barbara Brown Taylor says, abandoning the language of sin will not make sin go away. Human beings will continue to experience alienation and death, no matter what we call them. And abandoning, abandoning the language will simply leave us speechless before sin and increase our denial of its presence in our lives. And she says, yet, you have to be assured, she writes, and we think it's safe to say that Christians should never have to worry about the commercialization of Ash Wednesday. Hallmark will not invest in cards for Lent and for repentance and for sin. It's not on their drawing board. I want to turn your attention to our story today, Luke chapter 5, which really shows us the power of forgiveness and the power of uh, the power of, of healing that comes when we go to the very feet of Jesus. And we learn here, again, the setting uh, that, uh, that Patty described is one in which Jesus is surrounded by what Scripture tells us are religious leaders, the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the, 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 uh, the clerics of the law. It says that they have come to hear Jesus teach, and they came from all of the surrounding towns. So this is really kind of a, uh, a religious gathering. Um, it's almost like a theological conference. Jesus is surrounded in this home by dozens of religious scholars and religious leaders, those who know the scriptures, those who ought to know the, the way of God and ought to bring God's blessing to the people. But it's that very community that keeps the people who, mo who need Jesus the most out. Friends bring a paralytic to Jesus knowing that he has the power to heal, and they find a crowd of religious leaders keeping them out of the house. They can't get through, and they can't pass through. So you know the story. The friends lift him up to the ceiling and uh, put him on a mat and, and lay, uh, drop him down on the mat, lower the mat in the heart of Jesus and in the presence of Jesus. And there, Jesus says, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, this is interesting. The man is paralyzed, and you might come to think that Jesus is tying the paral his paralyzation to sin, but Jesus is doing something that is the most basic aspect of healing that a person can bring another person. Basically, to hear the words of forgiveness, to hear the words of belonging, to be called friend, and to simply find a place of affirmation and of relief and release. He doesn't really say anything about the healing. He just says, your sins are forgiven. It's at that point that the religious leaders who try to crowd out this guy in the first place start to cry blasphemy. And Jesus, discerning their heart and discerning their mind, asks a very simple question. Which is easier? Is it easier to say, your sins are forgiven? Or is it easier to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? Now, think about this. He's asking them a very simple question, but I, you know, I always like to think that, that Jesus gets a little bit of a, a New York state of mind in this question, you know? Like, you know, like what's easier, to say you're forgiven or to, to say get up and walk to be healed? Well, obviously the answer is, well, it's really easy to say your sins are forgiven. I mean, that's much easier than, than bring to bear healing to make a paralytic, who's a guy who's been paralyzed his whole life, to walk. 
But I think what Jesus is doing is something deeper. I think he's confronting the religious leaders with their failure to do the most basic thing that any person of faith can do. And that is to bring release and a sense of belonging to a person by helping them understand that a place of faith is a place of forgiveness. That when you're in the midst of these religious leaders who know that God is merciful, they know their scriptures that God forgives from one generation to the next. They know that God is slow to anger and God is a God of healing. That their most basic task as religious people of faith is to simply help people find release and find forgiveness. And so Jesus is not really being sarcastic so much as he is confronting the religious leaders with a, very, with a failure of a very basic step in bringing healing to something in which we all share, which is that sin sickness that keeps us in bondage, that keeps us tied down, that keeps us wrapped up and entangled in those things that really bring on the, the, the hurts and the deepest, um, the deepest sin that really uh, envelops our life. And Jesus says, you've neglected the easiest thing you can do, which is simply to forgive people and to bring release and to remind people that God is a gracious God, slow to anger, quick to love, a God who forgives from one generation to another. That's Exodus chapter three. And then, of course, what Jesus does is he doesn't give them time to answer. You know, he asks the question, but he doesn't really uh, get into a debate. Jesus has no time for debates. He never debates, by the way. He always hits the heart of the matter. And then he turns to the fellow and he says, take up your mat, stand up, take your mat, and go home. This is really amazing. Because what this does is when Jesus brings healing to the paralytic, the man who's paralyzed, he knows that the paralysis is where this man needs the healing the most. But Jesus also knows that this man needs release because he's been marginalized his whole life. You have to remember, if you had a disability or an illness or an ailment in the biblical world, you were alienated. You had to separate yourself from your community. You couldn't go home to see your loved ones. You had to stand separate from them. If you had leprosy, you had a community that quarantined you, and you were always in quarantine. You were always isolated. You can never be restored to your family unless you are made well. And so what Jesus does, the first and foremost thing, is show us that when he's mending this man's cup, it's not just about his physical ailment, in where he, which is the point in which that needs healing. He also needs release and belonging. As his friends place him in the middle of a crowd, which is courageous, by the way, they could be uh, tried for it because they're breaking the law, Jesus does the one basic thing that really allows this man to find holistic healing, and that's release and forgiveness and then it's at that point that Jesus doesn't help him up or help him with his stuff. Jesus challenges the man to participate in his own healing. He tells him, stand up. He empowers him to stand up. He has permission to find healing. He stands up. And then Jesus says, take your mat. I love this when Jesus says this. This reminds us of uh, what we talked about last week, how we come as wounded healers of how our, the, the areas in our life in which we're broken, we bring it to bear to allow G Jesus' light to shine through the cracks in our life. And here when we're talking about the mended cup, we have to note that Jesus not only empowers the man to participate in his own healing, but he also asks him to carry his mat, mat a reminder of where he was, a reminder of the miraculous work that God did in his life. This man now carries his mat, carries his wounds and his scars and that reminder that healing is possible through Jesus and that the good news of Jesus is not only this release but also this empowerment to participate in the lives of the healing of others, just like his friends did for him. And Jesus doesn't say, follow me. I find this interesting. Jesus could have said, follow me. He says, go home because Jesus knows that being reunited with family, the reconciliation and restoration that happens as a part of that journey of healing, is more important at this moment than him to follow Jesus in his journey to Jerusalem. And that healing is not complete until reconciliation and restoration takes place. You see, forgiveness is the first step in becoming whole. It's finding that release. It's simply finding the emotional permission to move on from ourselves. 
And it's at that point that Jesus asks us and empowers us to be a part of that healing presence of Jesus Christ, to carry our wounds and our scars into community, to go back to community, and to share the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. It is so very important. I have come to learn over the years that we can, that our advancements as a society, our technological therapies, our various interventions can only bring us so far. They can make us whole. They can do miraculous works. And we say that all the time, that, that doctors and nurses in our midst and professionals, caregivers, therapists, counselors, first responders, those who really intervene in our life are the real heroes in our midst who bring about, whether they know it or not, God's miraculous works. But to be made whole, to really go to the finish line, we have to acknowledge that we need to be a people who bring release and forgiveness, that we need to hear those words, I forgive you, that we need to acknowledge that sin sickness. After Jesus rose from the dead, he empowered his disciples to share his word. And it was in the upper room when Jesus joined his disciples that Jesus gave his disciples the power not only to share the testimony of Christ, but also to be the healing presence of Christ. I want you to hear these words. This is John chapter 20, verse 21. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he has said this, he had said this, he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now listen to this next verse. This is John 20, verse uh, 23. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Listen to the power of that language. When we talk about mending our cup, we need to recognize that our cups are made whole by acknowledging the sin sickness that keeps all of us, that that is uh, we all hold in common, and that Jesus has to forgive us, and we need to receive that forgiveness. But you also have to recognize the power of what it means to forgive and to be a ambassador of reconciliation that reminds people that God's forgiveness is available to us. You you may need to find a a friend or two in which you have the emotional permission to confess some of those things that keep you in bondage. And brother and sister in Christ, you have the power to help people receive God's forgiveness by reminding them that they are forgiven. But just as much as you have the power to help people find release and belonging and to participate in God's healing presence, so too do you have the power to bind people up and to hinder people from receiving forgiveness by holding on to old resentments, by failing to acknowledge that sin sickness is something we all hold in common, and by remembering that God calls us to reconciliation and restoration, that if we retain the sins of many or retain the, the, yeah, the sins of many, we fail to give forgiveness or to offer forgiveness or just to give people the emotional permission to express their deepest hurts, that we might be part of that resistance that people are finding to bring healing to their life and to make their lives whole and to mend their cup. We have so much power as brothers and Christians in Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring freedom and restoration and to help people find release while people are walking through their various hurts and various journeys of life. We bring our wounds and our hurts with us. They are not to be left behind to show how God's miraculous healing presence continually works in our life. May we be people who knows what it's like to receive forgiveness and who can give the gift of forgiveness simply by sharing the love of Christ with others. Amen. Let us pray.